Welcome folks, my name is Brian Clark, aka Clarkio, and you are watching the Visual Studio Code release highlights video for June and May 2020. Let's go check out some of the highlights from those releases right now. All right, folks, we're going to start with the May 2020 release highlights. And now some of these features are going to be like maybe thinking that, oh, you know what? They're not that big of a deal. They're kind of small. Well, that's good. We want to highlight these small ones because they have a big impact. The first one we're going to take a look at is pinned tabs. What is pinned tabs? It's probably a lot of what you're already thinking. You have a few tabs open, maybe a lot more than just these three that I have open here. And you want to keep one open regardless of whether you close other tabs and whatnot, right? So you want to pin it. You want to save it. You want to keep it there at the top of the bar. So I right click on it and I can pin it. But you'll notice from this context menu, you can use a keyboard shortcut, control K, shift enter. And now that tab is smaller. If you enable breadcrumbs, you could see the name of the file at least still. And now no matter what I do, if I go and I say close all, it close all other tabs. These pin tabs stay pinned regardless of whether you choose close all tabs. They do not close when using commands such as close others. The other thing to mention here is that pin tabs always appear first before non pin tabs. So like I had these other ones open, they're always the pin tabs are always going to stay here. If I just pin this one now, it's going to stay over there. Uh, and the other thing to just note here is that they do not close even if you exceed a set limit on the number of opened editors. So if I just went crazy and opened up every possible file, it's not going to affect things in terms of my pin tabs. So hopefully you like that. It's a nice little time saver to keep the tabs open, the files open that you are actively working and you want to keep an eye on and quickly access them. Check out pin tabs. All right, this feature is from the May 2020 release, and it is called Sash Size Configuration. And you might be wondering, what is that? What is a sash? Well, if you take a look at the screen here, we have our main editor view that shows the contents of a file that we might have open. And then for me, I have my Explorer view over on the right-hand side. And in between these two views, there is what's called a sash. It's a little bar that's in between separating the two. When you, I hover my mouse over, that area, you can see it's a very tiny space, view space of where my mouse has to be in order for me to have that icon to be able to readjust the size of each view on e either side of it, right? So I'm moving the explorer bar to be bigger, explorer view to be bigger rather, and the editor is shrinking and vice versa. So this is your sash. This also works between your bottom panel views that you have, like the terminal and debug console. I bring that up with control J. And this is a sash as well. And you'll notice, again, the area, the surface area of where my mouse has to be in order to bring up that mouse cursor uh, that shows me the ability to resize this view is quite small. This has always bugged me uh, in order to try and do this with my mouse and to click and resize views. Now it's going to be easier with sash size configuration. We're going to bring up our settings. And we're going to search for sash size. And here you go controls the feedback area size in pixels of the dragging area in between views slash editors. Set it to a larger value if you feel it's hard to resize views using the mouse. I do, I struggle. The low end of the size that you can have is a four value. So if I try to do like one, it's gonna tell me no. And then the high end is 20. So if I try to do like 21, you can see you can only, only go up to 20. So I'm gonna make it max. And then let's see how that changes now. So as I move my mouse closer to the sash, the icon, see, I'm not even really on it. I'm glad about that, though. You may want to have a different setting, maybe a value closer to the middle between 4 and 20, but this allows me to quickly and easily get to what I want to do in selecting the sash to resize the views that I'm clicking on. All right, so this feature is one that I've been anticipating, and it's seemingly getting very promising to have this type of functionality, and it is called Cross File Undo for Closed Files. You now will be able to undo across files even if the files have been closed in the meantime. The edited files will be reopened and a cross file operation, such as a rename symbol, will be undone in all affected files. Now it's very important that they mention the rename symbol because as I found in testing this out, it's not a universal undo. And what I mean by that is if I come in here and I change this and I say console.log in this file and say just test, save that, close this file and do control Z, which is the keyboard shortcut to undo or command Z if you're on Mac. 
it does undoing in this file, but it does not go back to the effects manager file I made changes to. So I would have expected it would to pick up that history, but maybe that is something that will come in the future. Specifically though, let's get into a real example that this does help improve the overall developer experience. If I rename a symbol, as they suggest in the description of this feature, let's rename this to just have a one in it, enter, that is being used by this alerts listener class that I, or file that I have up here. So now I can close constants. If I come in here, I haven't changed anything in this. If I press control Z, I undo. It then prompts me, you zoom in here, would you like to undo renaming unhandled alert type log across all files? I could say just in this file, but I want both files. And then the other file opens up and shows the change back to the original name without the one in it. So that's pretty cool. I'm hoping that uh, continues to improve and keep more of a undo history across files as well. So I hope you like that. Check it out. In the June 2020 release of Visual Studio Code, the new JavaScript debugger is now the default debugger. Yay! If you have not checked out the features of this debugger, I've covered this in a past video. We'll have a link to it in the description or highlighted somewhere so that you can get access to it quickly. But things like being able to profile your application and generate a flame graph are just the tip of the iceberg of what this new JavaScript debugger provides for you. And I think it's a fantastic addition or improvement upon Visual Studio Code as a web developer and JavaScript developer myself. So check that out and enjoy. Over the past couple of releases, the source control view within Visual Studio Code has seen a lot of improvements. One of them that I want to point out to you is the capability to view and sort items within the view, in particular the changes that you may have made within your project. So here I have an audio file, constants, overlay, sound effects. Those files have been changed, and I want to kind of get a different bird's eye view into how those are changed or what's going on with them. Maybe I need, I have more, I need to sort them better in a more easily understandable way. I need to click on this little menu item, the three dots in the top right hand part of this panel, this collapsible panel for the source control view. Click on that, hover over view and sort. And now because of my theme, this is why it's looking this way, but it kind of blends in the sub menu that we have here. And again, this is just my theme that's causing this. So if you're on the default theme, you might see this a little bit more clearly. You hover over view and sort, you have the option to view as a list, view as a tree. Let's click on that. And then that shows us the tree view in terms of the file explorer type view of where the files that I've changed reside within my project. So we have some that are within the server folder, some that are within the client folder, all within the SRC folder, right? So, and I can collapse and expand these things as much as I want. Uh, if I switch back to view as a list, then I can say, hey, let's sort them by status. They're all under the modified status, so there's no changing there. We can sort them by name, which they're all in that order already. Uh, let's, you know what, let's make a quick change in the client under here. And do I have a comment? I'll just add a comment somewhere. Right, let's save that. Now, okay, so now it is sorted by name, right? So sound stream. If we go back and we sort by path, then we're going to see SRC client, SRC client, and then server is there, right? And then last but not least, we can sort by status again, and that's just modified. So there you go, some cool new capabilities within the source control view to help you kind of manage all the changes that you might be making as part of your projects. All right, another feature I want to mention, this has to do with Visual Studio Code being available in more places. In this case, it's Windows ARM64 based systems. So something like the Microsoft Surface Pro X. In the May 2020 release, they announced that it was available under the Insiders build of Visual Studio Code. But now, since we're covering both May 2020 and June 2020 in this highlight video, in June 2020, you'll find that stable Windows ARM builds are available under the stable release. So go ahead and check that out for those ARM-based systems that you're using, if you want to leverage Visual Studio Code on them, you now can. Check it out. So, did you know you can run Visual Studio Code in the browser today? Yes? No? Well, if it's no, 
I'm going to show you right now that you can. And that browser support and features within the browser support are listed out in the latest release to let you know, for instance, that large file upload is now being better supported and going to indicate progress with more accuracy to on the what has been uploaded of that. So with that in mind, if you haven't seen or heard that you can run Visual Studio Code in the browser, let me show you really quick how you can. If you go to online.visualstudio.com, you'll sign in. You have to have an account. You have to have a plan. We're going to skip over that for right now. What you can do is you can create what's called a code space, Visual Studio code space. This is run and backed on uh, Azure and allows you to run different types of instances of development environments that will run Visual Studio code for you in the browser. Now, if you don't want to necessarily use Azure to host your development environment, you can have your own hosted somewhere else, like such a VM somewhere, or you can even set up your own machine on your own home network to become a code space for you. And we're not going to go into the details of that, but I'm going to show you really quick through the UI how you can create a code space for yourself. And as a result of that, you click on this create code space, give it a name. You can have it point to a GitHub repository or a Git repository, not necessarily a GitHub, just a Git repository. And it will load up that contents of that repo inside of this development environment, this code space, and open up Visual Studio Code for you. Now, I entered one and created a test one without any Git repository, which is this test one and open up this tab and this is the existing environment so you can see for the test code space that i have you can see i essentially have like majority if not all of the functionality you would expect in visual studio code all within the browser very cool very interesting i highly recommend you check it out i've been enjoying doing this it allows me to jump from machine to machine very easily without having to rebuild a whole development environment and pick up right where i left off on any projects I'm working on. So give it a shot. Again, this is browser support for Visual Studio Code. You can access it and sign up for this type of thing at online.visualstudio.com. That does it for the highlights in this video, folks. So thank you so much for watching it. I hope you got some value out of it and enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to share it so others may do so as well. Thanks again. I'll see you next time. Happy coding, everyone.